Lord Jesus, your words are heavy, Lord, yet they are beautiful. Lord, your words are challenging but filled with grace. And as we continue to study your words and your beautiful Sermon on the Mount, Lord, I just pray that we, we do so in a way that honors the beauty of your holiness and celebrates at the power of your grace. I long that we are a congregation that is unified in our love and celebration of you. And that we are wise and able to see those who would steal that unity, steal from your glory, and lead us astray. So today as we study your word by your Holy Spirit, I pray that you would guide us into right reflection, right teaching, right honoring of you so that we may be a unified congregation because of the study of your scriptures. So that as we leave from here, we would be stronger, more able to declare the glory of your grace. So today, we commit this time into your hands that you may be honored and glorified in it. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. So we are coming down the home stretch of the Sermon on the Mount. Um, we have this week and two more weeks, and then we'll conclude our sermon series in this wonderful text. And so since it's been a couple of weeks since we've last been in the Sermon on the Mount through um, Easter and other various uh, couple of things like a sermon, the pastor deciding to take a vacation, uh, <laughs> we're going to do just a start by a little bit of a recap. What kind of has happened in the Sermon on the Mount the, the last time on Lost or whatever show they have out now that they do last time on. Um, so the Sermon on the Mount is a beautifully composed sermon that Jesus takes his listeners through many important, difficult subjects. And ultimately, I believe the Sermon on the Mount points us to a deeper relationship with God. He, he, and he begins the Sermon on the Mount, with a section called the Beatitudes. And the Beatitudes outline the type of person who have a blessed life in God. And unlike the people the world elevates, Jesus elevates those who are poor in spirit, those who are meek, those who are broken, those who are mourning, those who are hungering and thirsting for righteousness. And I find it significant that Jesus begin, begins his Sermon on the Mount here in the Beatitudes. Begins the Sermon on the Mount here in brokenness and mourning and meekness and hungering and thirsting for righteousness. Because here he is giving us an image of the person of the kingdom of heaven. They are completely dependent on God completely dependent on God. This dependence is significant because the rest of the Sermon on the Mount has some very difficult teachings that require humility and brokenness. And if we approach the teaching of Jesus thinking, oh, we, I have to get it all together myself, and I'm not dependent on Jesus to do this task, then I quickly fail at the rest of the teaching of the Sermon on the Mount. We have to understand that we are utterly dependent on Jesus to be able to live out the tasks that he has set out for us to do. So dependent that when he ascended into heaven, he sent us the Holy Spirit so that we would do those good things he's prepared for us in advance to do by the power of his own Holy Spirit. And if we are not utterly, humbly dependent on him in our deep brokenness, then we will fail at the task. That's why I love the, the, the song we sung right before announcements because um, Oh How He Loves Us is a song about being dependent on God's love and grace in the midst of our brokenness. 
The, the song was written during the time where the, uh, John Mark McMillan's friend passed away in a sudden car accident, and he wrote this song. He had like the kind of the, 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 the hook written, but he didn't write the rest of the song until after his friend passed away. And you can really understand the weight of grace in that song. And, and that's the way we need to be when we approach these sections of uh, the Sermon on the Mount specifically, but any teaching on the Bible. We need to be broken and dependent on the grace of God to live it out. And then it becomes a freedom and not a burden. Because Jesus goes straight from the Beatitudes into a section on the law. And I think Jesus wanted to show us that the law is an important teacher. He wanted to show us that um, it's not that God, it, God doesn't just want our behaviors. He does desire right behaviors, but ultimately God wants our heart. He wants us to love him and desire him so much we live differently. And I think in this law section, in the way Jesus turns the law up to 11, that He's showing us that, that God wants our hearts. And again, we are ultimately dependent on God to be able to do this. And when we are dependent on God, it's no longer a crushing burden, but a liberating freedom that through the power of the Holy Spirit, we get to live out the, the teachings of Jesus in the law here. And then Jesus moves on from the law into prayer, giving, and fasting. And he's contrasts people who give so that the world may see that they've been giving and, and versus people who give humbly and in secret or pray humbly and in secret. And, and Jesus, again, is saying that he wants our hearts. And, and ultimately, I think the, the um, chapter 6, you kind of have the, the, the key theme of the Sermon on the Mount, and I would even argue all of the Gospel of Matthew is this idea of where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What do you treasure above all else? Because what you treasure above all else is what you will pursue above all else. And if you've placed your ultimate treasure in the kingdom of heaven, then there is nothing on this earth that can take that away from you. It's the ultimate retirement plan. The... Uh, you know, the stock market may go up and down and take from your 401k, but nothing is going to take from your reward in the eternal kingdom of God. And that is quite comforting. And now, finally, Jesus brings us to chapter 7, where he discusses the task of humbly judging the life of faith. This is a difficult task. Jesus reminds us in the beginning that we have to be grace-filled people. We have to be marked by the broken humility of the Beatitudes. There is a dependence on God to walk the narrow path to new life in God. And this brings us to the passage we have today. The question we are going to look at is, how do you judge if someone is a wolf in sheep's clothing? Or a good tree bearing good fruit? This is an interesting question because... Jesus just got finished saying in the beginning of chapter 7, do not judge or you will be judged. And yet we are supposed to evaluate who the, those people who teach the Word of God. We are to judge the actions of the person, especially uh, the person that teaches the Word of God in light of the Scriptures. And and when it's talking about evaluating and, and, and judging the, the fruit and knowing by the fruit and, and identifying a wolf in sheep's clothing, I don't think we're supposed to be judging the idea of, oh, that person's saved, that person's not saved, that person's saved, that not. that's not what he's talking about in this passage. What I think he's talking about is that person is going to lead the church astray, that person is... is, is is building up a kingdom for themselves and not a kingdom for God and being able to identify the intentions and the actions of somebody so that we can protect the unity of the church of God and keep our affections towards the glory of God. Because there are many, many, many who would love to lead 
the church of God astray so that they can devour her. So the judgment that Jesus teaches us to use is, is being issued, is, is based off of the actions and fruit of a person. Is there evidence of repentance and fruit of the Spirit? Are they humbly submitted to the authority of the Scriptures and the authority of the church? And this is some of the things we'll be examining today. So before we go any further, as always, let us jump into the Word of God, and I'll be reading Matthew uh, chapter 7, verses 15 through 20 out of the English Standard Version. So Matthew 20, or Matthew 7, 15 through 20. <clears throat> Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruit. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree does, that does not bear fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Jesus uses two metaphors to describe the person who is leading the church of God astray. The first image is a wolf in sheep's clothing, and the second one is a tree and fruit. The call to us from Jesus here is to be discerning. There are those who wish not only to lead the church astray, but to devour her. Then Jesus gives us indications on how to identify these people by switching the metaphor from wolves to fruit. And my hope is that at the end of this message, we'll be able to discern those who would lead the people of God astray, and we would flee from those people. So we're going to dive in. The wolf in sheep's clothing. First thing we notice about a wolf in sheep's clothing is that they are trying to deceive. They are making themselves look like humble, meek, little fluffy sheep but they are just wolves wearing a sheep suit. The first part of this passage, the wolf is trying to hide in plain sight by disguising himself as one of the sheep. And this is a profoundly dangerous situation. It's like Little Red Riding Hood. In her youthful naivete, she couldn't tell that something was off with grandma, but was unable to adequately discern what it was until it was too late. Thanks goodness for an axe-wielding huntsman. We need to be aware that those, that there are those who for the sake of their own appetites will take on the persona of Christian with the intent of massing their own power and eating off of the fat of the flock. A wolf in sheep's clothing presents himself as meek and humble, but he is just positioning himself so that the sheep let down their guard so that he can strike. And there have been many times where people have seemed like relatively qualified, amicable people, but what they quickly turn into are devourers of God's church. So what does it look like when wolves attack? Now that would have been a good name for the sermon title, When Wolves Attack. <laughs> Makes it also a good Discovery Channel show, right? Um, like Shark Week, we'll have Wolf Week uh, at the church. Uh. <laughs> I have seen wolves in sheep's clothing, and it has always been destructive to the church. The consistent behavior is that after they get themselves into a place of favor with the sheep, they begin to bring divisions within the congregation. Factions start to rise up, and, and instead of looking for reconciliation and repentance, they amass a following to their side and tear apart the church, both spiritually and numerically. Galatians 5, uh, 19 and following tells us that the works of the flesh, what the works of the flesh are. Identifying the works of the flesh helped the church catch a wolf 
attack before it happens. And this is what Galatians, uh, starting in, in verse 18, five, chapter 5, verse 18 says, But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. And then he goes into the works of the flesh. In verse 19, he says, Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warned you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Jumping forward to verse 26, Paul continues, let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Rivalries, dissensions, envy, provoking one another are important ways you can hear a wolf in disguise growl. A wolf thrives off the division of the church. And, and I want to make a caution here. There's a distinction between division and conflict. Conflict will happen in the church. This is a part of our sanctification process and it is not on its face a bad thing. That is because conflict can lead to repentance, reconciliation, and a deeper sanctification. It can lead to deeper unity in the congregation of Christ and a deeper dependence on God. The wolf, however, will use conflict to stoke combat through gossip and dissensions leading to division. Why would somebody do this, turn conflict into combat? They do this because the wolf is ultimately driven by his own passions and appetites. As 1 John 2, 15 through 16 states, do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. They love the lusts of the flesh, the lusts of the eyes, and the pride of life. The pride of life is boasting in their own possessions and circumstances. And when they do ministry, they seem to talk more about themselves than they do Jesus. On the surface, it's hard to tell, but ultimately, they draw the eyes of the church away from the goodness of the gospel and from the glory of God to earthly things. I cannot tell you the number of times where I've watched or attended church services where a lot of good, general, moralized, therapeutic, deistic application vaguely derived from the scriptures was taught. Up in front was a milquetoast man whose goal was to make people feel comfortable in church. More often than not, they were leading legions of people away from the pure fire of the glorious truth of the gospel by making people feel comfortable as opposed to holy. These church leaders were feeding off the flock, leaving them spiritually destroyed when they are called uh, to account for before God. one of the reasons why I try not to shy away from the hard teachings of the gospel. So I'm afraid of being that man. I have a tendency to, to want the approval of other people and the, a tendency to want to soft pedal things. But when we are dealing with something as, as, as profound as the holiness of God, as, 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 as pure as the justice of God, as deep as the grace and mercy of God, I want to treat it well. <laughs> and that's why I wrestled with God when he said, hey, preach through the Sermon on the Mount. I was like, are you sure? <laughs> There's some really good psalms that'll make everybody like me. And <laughs> God said, no, this is the one I want for you to preach. I want you to preach. So one more thing before we look at how to identify false prophets and teachers. I want to make a 
brief distinction, I'm going to add a little bit to the metaphor here, uh, a di brief distinction between wolves and rams. The, the problem and the weakness of modern evangelicalism is that we mistake rams for wolves. And, and here's what I mean by that. The rams are the people to whom God has given the unenviable task of being a prophetic voice to the congregation. Oftentimes, they get a bad rap because they start ramming into what looks like a sheep when in reality, the sheep is a wolf. The ram gets scolded. Why are you attacking that poor sheep? In reality, they have rightly identified the wolf. And a warning, if you are a ram type, don't ram too early. Make sure that you have rightly identified the wolf. But throughout the scriptures, and as I have seen in, in, in life, the one with the ministry to call out the wolf was never the popular one. We as a congregation need to be sensitive to the rams and intolerant of the wolves. I'm going to say that again. We need to be sensitive to the rams and intolerant to the wolves. But that sadly will be another sermon for another day. Um, as I mentioned previously, Jesus loves to mix his metaphors. And so we are looking at wolves. So, so are we looking at wolves or are we looking at produce? Because he's, he's talking about wolves and now he's talking about fruit. And the answer is yes. We're talking about both. Because we, we, we need to know something important about the destructiveness of a wolf. And there's a task in identifying the devourer of the church. And to distinguish between one who would destroy the church and one who would build up the church for the glory of God, the metaphor of gardening is brought in. And we have a, a role in identifying false prophets and teachers by looking at the fruit that they produce. Jesus tells us that we are... Jesus tells us that as we are confronted by people who may or may not be false teachers, we are to identify them by the fruit that they produce. It is important to properly identify a fruit prior to eating it. There are many plants that grow fruit, and just because they grow fruit doesn't mean that you can eat it. We tell our kids this all the time. It's, uh, my kids you know, love foraging. If you uh, come over to my house during any time during the spring, Half of my kids have like yellow all over their faces from eating dandelions because they love dandelions. They love sour grass. They, any plant that you can eat, they will try to eat it. And sometimes we have to say, no, stop, stop. You don't want to eat that one. <laughs> it's important to properly identify the plant that you are eating. Take, for instance, nightshade. The little berries can look like blueberries. Except when they're eaten, they don't taste as sweet and they'll kill you. Real blueberries grow on a woody shrub where nightshade doesn't. It grows on a hardy vine much like a tomato plant. One handful of these berries can kill you. And it's important to identify the plant and judge its fruit properly before eating it. So how do we judge a false prophet or teacher? By the fruit. Does their fruit produce life-giving, sweet-to-eat fruit or bitter poison? The first place you can look at is their teaching. Does their teaching comport with the sound teaching and doctrines of the Bible? And how do you know? I challenge you all to study the Bible for yourselves. Even as I'm preaching up here, I want you to be following along in your Bibles. I want you to go back home and study the scriptures well and see if the sound doctrine of the gospel is being preached here. It's important that you hold your pastors accountable and the teachers in your congregation accountable. This is one of the very important roles of the elders. The, the, one of the important roles of the elders is to hold the teaching of the church accountable to the scriptures so that we are not leading people astray into false doctrine. 
Often at our elders meetings, I, I'm, I'm covetous to know what the elders uh, are thinking about the teaching that is going on. And we pray over the congregation. And if the elders were ever to come to me and say, hey, that was off, I'm going to listen really hard because that's their job to make sure that the word of God is being preached here on Sunday morning and in small groups and in youth group and in all of the church that we are a congregation that holds fast to sound teaching of the gospel. And, and here's the problem is, is there are so many places where the weeds of false teaching are coming in to the church, especially the evangelical church today. The danger of these false doctrines is they fa- sound really Christian-y, but they aggressively lead people astray. The Apostle Peter and the Apostle Paul warn us about these types of false teachings. And Second Peter uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, this is what the Apostle Peter writes. But false prophets are also, also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing, them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And may, many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. And the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and following, I charge you in the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, who is the judge who is to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure the sound teaching, but have itching ears. They will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, enduring suffering. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Here are the two questions to ask so that you can know if the teaching of the Bible is, sounded, is sound or destructive. First, Does the teaching point you toward God or away from God? Secondly, does this teaching entice you to pursue your own sensualities over repentance? So here's the first one. Does it point you to God? Here's my problem with a lot of teaching that happens in modern-day evangelicalism, and I fear it's even affecting... uh, it's, it's affecting too many of the churches. We are beginning to preach a gospel where God is not the center. If you want to know what the entirety of the scriptures is about, the entirety of the scriptures is about God. It is about God's demand for justice measured by his holiness. And it is about his Grace, his beautiful, wonderful, mercy-filled grace in light of his justice. The main character in every sentence of the Bible is God. The problem is, is that we make me the main character of the Bible. We kind of preach, so we say, who, who has two thumbs and is the main character of the Bible? This guy. <laughs> We make ourselves arrogantly the main character of the Bible. This error says that the point of the Bible isn't God's holiness, but it is about what God does for me. Because if God's holiness is the center 
of the good news, then that makes a significant challenge to how I must live out my life. And so instead of placing God at the center of the gospel, I place myself at the center of the gospel. And a deadly weed will grow out of that. That will produce spiritual nightshade. The second is our own passions. This is the other, I think, main heretical teaching of modern evangelical Christianity in the West is that the point of the gospel is to make you feel good about yourself. And I believe this is a lie. It is what the Apostle Paul is warning against when he says to Timothy in in 1 Timothy 4.3, where he says, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but have itching ears. They will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. People who teach or follow this type of me-centered gospel will long to have their ears tickled with exhortations about how amazing I am. Because of how much God loves me, he wants to give me good things. So we make myself the center of the gospel. We make the gifts that God gives us not about his glory, but about how great I am. And this, again, is a deadly poison. We believe that if I, if I have enough faith, if I say the right thing, God will give me whatever I want. This form of the, the prosperity gospel has poisoned evangelical Christianity. We now worship the gifts of the gospel over the gift giver. And many, many congregations have fallen into idolatry because they've wanted their tickling ears, itching ears tickled. It's like the Israelites taking the provisions and plunder from Egypt. When when they left Egypt, God said, plunder Egypt. I've given Egypt over to you, and they took a vast amount of wealth out of Egypt when they left. And you know what they did with that wealth? That gift from God, that gold and silver and incense? When the sons of Aaron and Moses saw a, a pre incarnate version of uh, image of Jesus on the mountain, and then they came back down, and Moses went further up into the mountain to receive the law. What did Aaron and his sons and the people of Israel do? They took those gifts and provisions, melted them down into a golden calf, and worshiped the gift over the gift giver. I genuinely worry for evangelical Christianity in the West because we have replaced the gift giver with the gifts. We need to return Jesus to the throne of the gospel. Jesus needs to be the center of our vision. Our Heavenly Father needs to be the, the, the sole focus of our desire, the sole location of our treasure. And then all of the gifts fall into place. And the gifts don't become about me, but they become a way in which I can display the glory of my Heavenly Father. So Jesus tells us to identify the teacher, the leader by their fruits. One way you identify nightshade is by the branches and leaves of the plant. If the branches are woody and bush-like, you have blueberries. If you have a viney plant, you have nightshade. Jesus tells us you can identify the fruit by identifying the plant. 
This is many times the same way when it comes to false teaching. You can identify the fruit of the false teacher by identifying the false teacher. What are some characteristics of a false teacher that you can identify so that you know the fruit that they are producing is poisoned fruit? As we evaluate teachers and leaders in our congregation and in the church at large, how do we measure their fruit? One thing that I think is really important, again, is, is how are they living out the blessed life in Jesus? Are they really marked by the Beatitudes? What does their humility look like? In genuine, and it, is it genuine humility that recognizes a need for Jesus Christ and it longs to extend that same mercy and grace to other people? The Apostle Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 25, he wrote this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit outlined by Paul in many ways resembles the markings of the Beatitudes. This is a humble yet confident person because they recognize the freedom from their sin through the salvation they have in Jesus Christ. The security, sur, sur, security, blah, their security is found in the God of eternity, and it is not easily shaken. They're gentle. There's a gentle compassion to see many other people gain the same confidence in the salvation, in the salvation of Jesus Christ. This is a wonderful and good thing. This is, as they say, the fruit that will last. Ultimately, this person has no use in having other people see them. Instead, they become someone who reflects like a mirror the glory of Jesus Christ. And when they leave the room, you forget they were there and continue to worship Jesus. False prophets and false teachers, on the other hand, lack humility. Sometimes it's even worse than that. Sometimes they have a false humility. Many times they have a false humility. They often brag or make humor in self-deprecating ways, but in reality, they want you to look at them and realize how wonderful they are. The focus isn't Jesus. The focus is themselves. There's this thing called a humble brag. And uh, I wanted to come up with some examples of a humble brag. So I went on to uh, ChatGPT and had the, uh, the robots tell me, uh, come up with some examples of uh, humble brags for me. So uh, this is, this is uh, a couple examples of a humble brag as put together by our, <laughs> by uh, Skynet, is that what is? is <laughs> um, so, Ugh, I always end up being one of the people pe uh, other people come to for advice. It's like I'm everyone's therapist. I'm so bad at saying no to people. I just have this natural instinct to help whenever I can. I really need to start saying no to all these invitations. It's like I'm the life of the party without even trying. I don't know how to manage to stay so I don't know how I managed to stay so grounded with all this success. I guess it's just my humble nature. I'm always the designated driver because I guess people just trust me to make responsible decisions. I don't like to draw all the attention to it, but I've memorized so many Bible verses. It's just something I've always been really good at. I'm not perfect, but I do try to live my life according to the Christian values. It's all about striving for holiness, you know. I don't like to talk about it, but I've been on multiple mission trips to help those in need. It's really opened my eyes to the world. See, 
See kind of what's happening in these humble brags? They're, they're, they sound like they're, they're, they're being self-deprecating and they're talking about how humble and broken they are, but really, the focus of the attention of all of those statements was I, me, myself. In these instances, it looks like a person is making a humble statement, but truthfully, they're going out of the way to make sure that you know they did something amazing. They will pretend to brush off when you compliment them, but they won't try very hard. This is a false humility. It is not about pointing people to Jesus, but pointing people to me. I've had people come to me for the first time and humbly tell me all the ways in which they are gifted. If somebody calls himself an apostle or prophet within the first five minutes of meeting me, you better believe they will never get a leadership position in this church. You know how I identify the true humble person, person worthy of position and praise in this church for the glory of God? This is the question I ask. How are they serving without recognition? Do they take out the garbage without thinking much about it? Are they happy to serve faithfully in small ways where no one will see them? If I offered, offered them an opportunity to serve in more upfront roles, do they humbly seek God first and make sure it's for his glory and not theirs? These are just some of the questions that I ask when, when looking for people to serve in leadership in God's church. The false teacher spreading false fruit will long to exploit the congregation of Jesus. He sees the people not as people gathered for the glory of God to find the lost by making disciples who make disciples. Instead, they think, if I am known in this church, it can help my political career. Or, it's many times, people just love being little tyrants. They don't have the skill or creativity or power to be a genuine governmental tyrant, so they settle for being tyrant, little tyrants over their HOA and churches. So how do you def identify if the person of potential leadership is a, uh, a poison plant or a genuine sheep? Mixed metaphor intended. I think there are several, several questions we can ask that will yield proper insight. So I'm just going to start listing off some questions. What is their love for the Heavenly Father? A, is it a genuine love that flows out of humble gratitude for what Jesus has done? Has their love for the Heavenly Father has their realization of the gospel changed who they are from the inside out? What happens when this person is confronted with their th sin? Fruit or thistles? What happens if that person is confronted with their sin? This is a very important way to identify good fruit. Because if you get fruit instead of thorns or thistles, then you'll know that you're reaching into the right plant. After the initial shock of being confronted in their sin wears off, do they blame others, attack you, make excuses, or do they repent like David did and turn from their sins? Someone who is a thistle tree will try to draw blood when confronted with their sin. What is their love for the law of God? Do they love to follow the law of God? This is not a legalistic, look how righteous I am, and type of following the law. This is an I desire to make my heavenly Father pleased, so I want to live like Jesus how we live out the commands of the scriptures reveals 
our relationship to the Heavenly Father? Are we doing it in a legalistic way so that everybody knows how great we are? Or are we doing it because we want to make our Heavenly Father proud? Are we doing it because we think that we can force God to give us some form of salvation? Or are we doing it because we are free to live out new life in Jesus Christ? Do they confess and repent from their sins? If someone is unable, unwilling to confess and repent from their sins, they cannot be trusted with the things of God. Even the priests that went into the temple to make an atoning sacrifice uh, had to make atoning sacrifices for their own sins prior to entering the temple. Does the person before you honestly and vulnerably have someone with whom they can confess their sins and do. What is their love for the gospel? Is their love for the gospel a desire to see broken people made whole, sinners saved from their sin, lost people adopted into the family of God? Or is their love for the gospel just to get butts in pews? If they're more concerned about numbers than they are about souls, then you should be cautious about eating their fruit. This is a limited list, but one I think is important to take seriously. Because in verse 19 of this passage in Matthew, um, Jesus says this. He says, Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. The false teachers will be thrown into the fire with their false teaching. The one who exploits the church will be subject to the wrath of God. This is a terrifying prospect and one I wrestle with every time I write a sermon. Will this bring glory to God or to me? As the Apostle Paul writes in Galatians 1.8, Even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so I now say it again. If anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. The person who leads the church of God astray for his own glory is liable to damnation. And this is a terrifying thought. And this is where I wish we could conclude with a, on a happy note. But the very next passage that Jesus, we're going to study in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is going to make it even more terrifying. We're going to approach the most terrifying passage in all of the scriptures is when Jesus says that there are some that even say, Lord, Lord, Didn't I do these things in your name? And and Jesus will say, turn from me, I never knew you. And every time I read this passage, I, I get chills just thinking about it. But this is why I'm grateful that Jesus put the Beatitudes at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. Because when we approach texts like this in, uh, in, in 21 to 23 that we'll look at next week or next time we're together is that the the beautiful dependence on Jesus the beautiful dependence on God as our heavenly father that is what sustains us that is what gives us our confidence. We constantly must be turning our dependence, our humility, our brokenness, our, 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 our need for grace and mercy to Jesus Christ. So that when we approach passages like this, where it says, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? We have confidence because we know who we once were and who we now are because of the cross of Jesus Christ. As it says in Romans, we were once enemies of God, but now we are children of God. 
because of what Jesus Christ did for us. That's why it's important, I think, that we regularly remember what Jesus did for us on the cross. And that after especially heavy messages like this, we, we remind ourselves of the gospel. That it is not a work that we have done, but it is according to the mercies of God that we have been saved. And, and Jesus gave us this beautiful symbol so that we could proclaim and preach the gospel to ourselves and to each other in the way in which we take the, the communion cup together. And so if you don't know Jesus, my desire that this would be the Sunday that you would put your faith in Jesus Christ. That this would be the act of you declaring that Jesus is the one true Savior of the world. And for those of us who know Jesus, this table, this cup, this bread is for you to be reminded daily that it is not by the work that you've done, but the work of Jesus Christ on the cross that you are saved. So the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, he held it up, and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Whenever you eat, eat and remember me. So let us eat together. The same night, he took the cup and held it up and said, this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you. Whenever you drink, drink and remember me. Let us drink together. Heavenly Father, we long to be a congregation that sets our eyes on you. That we long to be a a congregation that reflects your beauty and holiness, your justice and your grace, Lord, and your love for us. That as we remember the work you did for us on the cross, Lord, may may we be transformed by it, Lord. May we no longer see ourselves, Lord, but see you. Turn from who we once were and turn to who you are, knowing that you are transforming us into your image and that you promise that you will not leave us or forsake us, Lord, that the work you began, you will carry into the day you return. So I pray for this congregation, Lord, as we remember communion, Lord, as we study the hard words of your teaching, Lord Jesus, I just pray that we would be a church that longs to set our eyes and hearts on you and desire more of you with ever gathering. We pray this in your beautiful and holy name. Amen.